Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and today I have another awesome guest for you guys. I'm talking to the great Steve Bissett. I, you probably know his work best from the amazing run on Swamp Thing he's done. That's how I discovered his work when I was younger. And it is an honor and a privilege to be able to talk to you today, man. Welcome. My, my great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me in, Ryan. I really appreciate it. So. Yes. I like to ask everybody, especially if it's the first time I'm getting a chance to talk to them, I always like to ask how they first got into comics. What started their love for comic books? Uh, for me, it was comic books were everywhere when I was a kid. I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was of the generation born in 1955 where comic book spinner racks were pretty omnipresent. You know, mom and pop stores, supermarkets, mm. uh, every place had comic books, uh, pharmacies. Um, so even growing up in the backwoods of, of Northern Vermont, I, I hop on my bike, I could find comics. Um, I had a, an older brother, Rick, uh, he had uh, his circle of friends. They all had stacks and stacks of comic books. So I got pulled in initially as a reader. And then around the age of, uh, I don't know, somewhere between the age of four and five, my family moved from Essex Junction, Vermont to Duxbury, Vermont. And right across the street, uh, was the Casey family, and I became best friends with Mitch Casey. Mitch was a little older than me by a year and a half, maybe two years, but we bonded as friends, and Mitch drew the first comic book I ever saw a human being draw. It was a little mini comic mm -hmm. called Attack of the Giant CC Flies, and I, I think that's when the fireworks really went off in my head, because, you know, when you're a kid absorbing the pop culture, you're not cognizant of people make these things you know right <laughs> it's yeah. all just sort of some sort of magic or something and it was seeing mitch you know draw this mini comic that uh really made me want to draw comics and i did i started doing just what mitch was doing and being the younger kid i think i suspect i probably copied a lot of what mitch did you know the, the giant insects were so cool i had to do my own of course like, i know you were drawing the comics but what, like when did it when did it, the, the switch flip in your mind where you were like, it's not just for fun. I want to do, this is what I want to do with my, with my life, with my career. Uh, for me, it was a, a two tier thing, Ryan. I really wanted to make movies, right? Okay. I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm still a complete movie addict. Um, as hard yeah. a time as a lot of people have had dealing with the pandemic uh, with not going to churches. And I'm not exaggerating and I'm not ridiculing anybody uh it's right. been like that for me with movie theaters because from the age yes. of 16 when i had a license on i went to the movies two and three times a week without fail um and i often went by myself you know and uh and that's been the hardest thing to like wean myself off of and, and go cold cold turkey on so i really yeah. wanted to make movies and to make a long story short you know growing up in the 60s the only access my generation had to any kind of affordable filmmaking technology was silent eight millimeter or silent super eight cameras and it just didn't satisfy me you know i even played with doing experimental films you know i by the time i was a teenager i was seeing underground films by filmmakers like stan brackage and marie menken and maya darren and kenneth anger and i even dallied with making you know, little art films. But when you're 14, what the hell can you make an art film about? <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't satisfying. It wasn't, I couldn't create what movies did, you know? And, and, um, and I also did a lot of theater, you know, a lot of stage work in, um, uh, especially in junior high and high school. And I continued that in college. And uh, I acted, I did the tech side of theater, you know, backstage lighting sets, all that stuff. And that was really intoxicating. But once you did your performances, it was gone, right? It was mm -hmm. forgotten. It was barely a memory. So it was that combination of not being able to make movies the way that I saw them in my head and uh, doing a lot of theater work from all sides that were accessible in junior high, high school, college that convinced me that doing comics was the way to go. Because number one, I didn't need money to do it, Ryan. I needed a right. piece of paper and I needed this, right? A piece of right. paper and this, and I could, I could tell stories. Number two, and this had been a big headache with filmmaking and I had learned with theater from experience, 
you had to convince a lot of people that your idea was so good <laughs> that yeah. they should they should show up <laughs> and work with you on your thing. And that was impossible. That that seemed like this impenetrable firewall to me. The third thing was I had a friend, uh, one of my closest friends in high school, Bill Hunter, who uh, did go to college in the Boston area to study filmmaking. I took a year off between high school and, uh, uh, and starting college. Bill went to Boston. And I don't know what happened there, but he committed suicide when he came back home. And I, that suddenly put a life and death spin on it. And I'm not trying to be morbid or, or bum anybody be out. But I, that, that day is when I decided I love comics. If I don't try to do comics as a living, as my livelihood, I will regret it the rest of my life. Because I now had an opportunity that my best friend had just checked out of, right? Um, and that was the point where I really pursued it with a passion, where that's all I uh, worked toward was to make comics and to draw comics. And all I had was a sketchbook. I didn't even know how to work a brush, Brian, uh, Ryan. I, I didn't even know, you know what brush to use. I was using little uh, Sharpies and ballpoint pens. <laughs> yeah. But I had sketchbooks that I filled with comics. And by the time the Joe Kubert School opened, uh, I had enough to show a portfolio. And um, uh, and had done a comic while I was at Johnson State College. I did two years at Johnson State College, mm -hmm. and and having a print comic, which was called Abyss, was my other portfolio piece, and that got me in the door at the Kubert School. So long story short, it was all that. Okay, um, I want to talk a little bit about Joe, the Joe Kubert School too, um, but before that, I just want to say that that is hearing you tell that story, like of your your friend committing suicide and what a pivotal moment and that shifted your life i think that's an awesome thing for people to hear because you took something that was really dark negative and you turned it into something very positive and because you, you, you know some people can let something like that kind of weigh them down and and you were able to i mean look at your career look what i mean if you can look back on that point from then into now and that's i think it's just a really cool story here so i, I really uh, yeah hearing that. well i appreciate that i mean i i'm i'm still heartbroken for Bill's, you know, family uh, with what mm -hmm. happened, but it really was the point where I don't think I understand, you know, you're a teenager, you're immortal. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I had lost, you know, I had lost a couple of classmates to car accidents and stuff by then. Um, but, but that was the point when I realized I've got an opportunity now to do something that I, I think part of it was the reason I mentioned that Bill had gone to college is I think I kind of vicariously channeled my desire to make films into Bill. You know how we sometimes do that with, yeah. with, with friends, with loved yeah. ones, where it's like, okay, they're doing that. So I, I'll just sort of, that'll take care of that itch I've got. And when that got truncated so brutally, it really put it on a life and death level of, okay, I, if I don't pursue this, I'd rather pursue it and fail mm -hmm. and be able to tell myself, you know, okay, I tried than to not pursue it because uh, a door was open for me. There was a gate open for me that a friend of mine had just closed by some perverse choice. Um, I should also mention, Ryan, there was also an unsavory aspect to all this, which was I read, I loved underground comics. Underground comics were what made me realize I could make a, uh, that I could make comics. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were in black and white, not color, which right. meant, okay, I could, I could figure out that print technology. Um, and I read an underground comic called uh, Skull Number no. Six, and Skull was my favorite underground comic of all of them. There were six issues in all. It was the cr the creme de la creme of the underground horror movement. And Skull Number no. Six, written by Tom Veach, drawn oh, nice. by Greg Irons and Richard Corbin, the end of chapter one so freaked me out that I dropped <laughs> I dropped the comic book. It was a visceral reaction that I had never had from comics before. I had had that reaction to cinema, and it was part of why I was so addicted to going to the movies, because movies really hit you, you know, yeah. very directly, very viscerally. And mm -hmm. when I read that, that underground comic, and a comic did that to me, that's also when a little switch went on in my head saying, I want to do this to people. <laughs> yeah. So that's sort of the unsavory aspect you know that the bent of my nature was already such that if a comic freaked me out that bad it was my desire to do that to other readers 
Um, and that's, that's awesome. That's what drove, you know, my that I when I was uh, when I first became friends with Scott McLeod and Scott and I have been friends, you know, so I think we first met in the in the uh, early 80s. Scott was like, what is it you really want to do, Steve? And I was like, I want to bring back horror comics. And <laughs> to Scott, that was a silly goal. But for me, that was the real goal. Like I wanted horror comics to be as powerful as I knew they could be. And I knew how powerful they could be because skull number six had so freaked me out. <laughs> I didn't want it in my hands. <laughs> so that's, there you that's, go. That's, I want to hear about the Joe Kubert school. And cause I know you were, you, you were either in the first or the first group class. First group. Okay, cool. First group. Yeah. I was in the, I was in the first class. Okay. Cause I grew up like from the minute I like couldn't remember of when, when I was er, my early reading comics, I always saw those Joe Kubert ads in the comic books, right? And I used to draw when I was younger, so I don't know why I ever stopped, but for whatever reason, I just kind of stopped drawing. But like, I was always like, man, I really wanna, I wanna go to the Joe Keyword school. So like, it was always kind of like this, like, um, I wanna say mythical thing, but it was always like this thing, like this unknown, like I always wanted to know more about it. So I was wondering if you can share with us a little bit about your experience there being in the inaugural class and, and kind of what that was like back then. It was, it was amazing. Um, it was, it was a, a literally a life changing experience on an, on all kinds of levels, but but um, it was in a little depressed New Jersey town, Dover, New Jersey, and I am in no way casting aspersions on the lovely <laughs> village of Dover, New Jersey. But you know, coming from Vermont, it was quite a culture shock to be mm. moving to New Jersey. Um, people don't people didn't look look me in the eye. Right. There was no eye contact going on because it was a more urban environment. And I learned very quickly. It only took like two days in New York City to learn that, you know, eye contact meant one of two things. You were a threat to that person <laughs> or they were crazy and they were going to come right to you <laughs> to start talking to you. So, you know, and it was also, though, that the Cubert School was this little uh, bucolic, heaven like <laughs> estate that sat up on a hill uh, in Dover, up above one of the residential districts. There were residential streets, and then you went up this slight incline, and up on the hill was the Baker Mansion, which was the first home of the Joe Kubert School. Now they're, uh, you know, downtown. Uh, Joe and Muriel uh, purchased uh, um, an abandoned high school, okay. and, and that's where the Kubert School has been since they moved to that building. And I think the old mansion, if I'm not wrong, uh, and please, somebody correct Ryan and I if I did get this wrong. I think it's now a dormitory for the school. Um, yeah. The students live there, which is also amazing. So uh, it was this real, um, almost monastery-like existence because all we were doing was studying comics. And that's all I wanted to do, you know? And it was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Classes were only five days a week, but those of us who are really into it, we didn't stop, you know? we spend our weekends at our drawing boards in that mansion uh, in the classroom, just working on, you know, the homework was, was pretty heavy. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the workload was pretty heavy. Um, uh, Rick Veach, who I met my first day at the Kubert School and really became fast friends with, we're still lifelong friends to this moment. Um, he and I would begin working on sort of side projects and pet projects and, and um, uh, it, it, you know, it, and it was like, it was like a retreat in which you lived just to eat, sleep, sleep shit, make comics. <laughs> that was all <laughs> it was about. Some of us had lives outside of the Hubert School. I was not one of those people. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a girlfriend. I wasn't in a relationship. I had just turned 21 uh, mm -hmm. that year that I went to the Hubert School. I was unattached. Um, in fact, even my anchor... So Vermont had been uprooted because my parents sold uh, the family business. We had a store, a grocery store, and they had moved to Florida. So I even had to get rid of most of my stuff, my material stuff. So it was a real major life transition for me, but it was perfect. It was just what I needed. And Joe and Muriel were like second parents. You know, they were that attentive and caring and uh this was their first year at the school as well ryan so this was a grand new experiment for them you know nobody yeah. knew if this was going to work <laughs> um yeah. joe and muriel included 
I've talked elsewhere, you know, Joe had his studio that first year uh, in the building that our classrooms were in. I think there are three floors to the Baker Mansion and a basement. Our classrooms were on the first floor the first year. And Joe's studio, uh, as you walk in the, these grand oak front doors, to the left were the classroom spaces. And to the right was this huge sliding oak door entryway to what was Joe's drawing studio. So there was also, all, you know, the later we got into that year, there was all, almost kind of an apprenticeship feel to the whole thing. You know, right. that Joe wasn't just the co-founder of the school along with his wife, Muriel, and also wasn't just quote unquote, one of our teachers, but that Joe was, Joe became a mentor for many of us, myself, def most definitely. And part of that was that close, constant personal contact that we felt with him. Mm -hmm. You didn't interrupt Joe when he was in his studio. Um, <laughs> he would make it clear, and I don't remember what the signal is, maybe Rick Beach or Tom Yates might recall, but you know, Joe would, would let us know when it was okay to go in and either watch him work, or I remember one afternoon and evening where Joe let Tom Yates open up this, uh, there was this huge cabinet that was part of the wall. You know, one of those huge oak, drawer sets of cabinets with glass doors and everything okay and joe let tom open up the drawers and he had all the sunday pages of prince valiant stacked in order and oh, wow. tom sat down and it was like you know this was like a religious artifact to us <laughs> yeah. tom sat down and sunday page by sunday page you know drank up those incredible how foster sunday pages and, and now tom yates is the artist on prince valiant you know this is how this is how these things come around yeah, that's great so it was it was an amazing experience ryan we also had the benefit of the grounds it was a really beautiful setting there was a swimming pool uh there were these giant trees out back that were just massive you know 75 mm. 80 feet tall and they had great branches for climbing and uh, Tom Yates, who's a huge Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan fan, uh, quickly got the nickname Korak, which was the son of Tarzan in the Burroughs novels, um, mm. because Tom would climb to the top of the trees sometimes <laughs> and just sit up there with a drawing board and draw on a nice day. Um, in the winter, it was beautiful. You know, once the snow fell, we, we wouldn't be climbing trees and enjoying, you know, sitting outdoors and, and, uh, and, and working or talking. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'd go back to the carriage house, which was our dormitory at the time, mm -hmm. um, puff a bowl, go over to the school, draw. And uh, it was great. It was just great. Um, the downside was Dover. I mean, Dover was a town that was <laughs> very much on the skids. And mm -hmm. I am not exaggerating when I tell you that when we started in September of 1976, we could walk downtown, which was probably a mile and a half, you know, at most a two mile walk to get groceries. And by our second year, we would have to like, you know, put together a pilgrimage with backpacks. And it was like a six mile hike out and back mm. to get groceries because a lot of the downtown businesses closed up. And it was, uh, it was not dissimilar to the kind of economic um, wasteland we're seeing happening in a lot of America right now. Very different reasons with the pandemic. But don't forget, we were at the Cubert School during the oil uh, shortages. You know, mm -hmm. I remember seeing fist fights at the gas stations. Um, oh, I didn't have a car, so I wasn't caught up in it. But I remember witnessing fist fights at the gas stations over who was going to get to the gas pump. Um, and at that time, they had an even odd system in New Jersey. There were certain days of the week where if you, if your number plate ended with an odd number, you could get gas. And the other alternating days, only an even number could get gas. And you can oh, imagine... Wow you know, the hell that played with people yeah. that were commuting into the city for work, you know, mm -hmm. so. So I've it was a crazy time. That. It was a crazy time in, in America and it was a, but it was a beautiful time for us at the Hubert School. Right, so I mean, you're saying 76. I know that there's, you know, I, I like I said, I discovered your work from Swamp Thing, which I absolutely love. And well, thank you. And if you could take me from when you were, after you left Hubert School, and what you did up until Swamp Thing, because I, I, I don't, I'm not as familiar with those, with those comics. Uh, okay, well, we were at Kubert School. Uh, I got to lay a little bit of bedrock in that Joe and Muriel had a work program. If you were um, sufficiently on top of your homework, and I have to phrase it that way because Rick Beach loves to remind me 
there was homework I never got done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if I don't acknowledge it, you know. Uh, but if you were sufficiently on top of your, your homework at the school, and I was, um, there was a work program. And some of us, like Rick Beach, myself, Tom Yates, Ron Zalmi, uh, a number of, of classmates, participated in that work program and the work program was multi-tier it was always paying work it didn't pay much you know some of those gigs we did paid five bucks ten bucks but it was it was work that we were doing that was going to see print so it was professional work joe mm -hmm. supervised it and this included those heroes world catalogs those tchotchke catalogs from the 70s yes. that i see a lot of people waxing nostalgic over online yeah, uh, but we also got to do uh, backup stories and battle albums, which were one page or double page spread um, illustrative albums on some aspect of military history. Uh, and this work was done for Sergeant Rock, which was the DC comic Joe edited. Mm -hmm. And Joe had full control over it, Ryan. Um, and he, if we satisfied Joe, the work saw print. So by the time we graduated in the spring of 78, it was a two year program. So fall of 76 to spring of 78, um, we had cut our teeth on doing pro work. And some of us uh, had even begun to sell their work. I, I, because I didn't know if I was coming back for a second year, during my first year, I was already putting together my portfolio and taking the bus into New York City and hitting art director's offices looking for work. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't know if I was going to be going back to Vermont that summer, and that would be, you know, the end of my Cubert School experience. So I landed work mm -hmm. with John Workman at Heavy Metal Magazine. In fact, I was among the first American artists uh, to sell some freelance work to Heavy Metal. I was not the first, and I mm -hmm. was certainly not of the caliber of Howard Chaikin or Walt Simonson. Um, and Richard Corbin's work was in heavy metal right from the start because he had been in Metal Herlant, which was the original Franco-Belgian magazine that heavy metal was translating. Mm -hmm. uh, but I sold work to, to John Workman, the art director. So by the time I graduated Hubert School, I had already built up a little client list, right? I was selling work to heavy metal. I had uh, one of the work program jobs I'd done for Joe was for Scholastic magazines. And this is before they were publishing graphic novels. This is when Scholastic was primarily incorporating comics into their um, magazines that were published and sold for uh, middle school, uh, junior high, and high school. And so it was sure. magazines like Bananas. And mm -hmm. I was lucky enough that uh, 1977, the year of Star Wars, that uh, Scholastic launched a magazine called Weird Worlds. And it was sort of their, you know, let's jump on the bandwagon of the science <laughs> fiction boom. But it right. was also sort of their monster magazine. And they, right from issue one, wanted to incorporate comics. And the editors were Bob and Jane Stein. Uh, Bob Stein's better known to you and your generation as R.L. Stein. He did the right. Goosebumps after mm -hmm. all this. And Joe had me completely pencil and ink and duo shade. I did tone work as well. The first of the three-page horror comics uh, that ever appeared in Weird Worlds. It was in Weird Worlds number one. And when I graduated, Joe gave me that contract, right? Mm -hmm. That was incredibly generous. Like he gave me a freelance client. <laughs> so I'm going into this because when we graduated in 78, uh, a small group of us, Rick Beach, Tom Yates, myself, and our classmate, John Toddleben. John Toddleben had come in the second year of Hubert School. Um, his classmates included Ron Randall, Jan Dersima, mm -hmm. Tom Mandrake, you know, I mean, a lot of high powered, uh, Craig Boldman, uh, yeah. a lot of cartoonists whose work you or your uh, uh, listeners slash viewers might be fans of. Um, when we graduated, Tom, Rick, myself, and John uh, went in on a house renting a house that was just you know like a mile outside of dover it was in the one of the closest townships and it was in a residential area that essentially bled right into dover you know the border between the two was invisible to us mm -hmm. we could walk right downtown and we all had this kind of tribal sharing outlook on what we were doing we did not see our classmates as competitors 
we were of a generation, we were of a mindset, very hippy dippy of us, that if mm -hmm. one of us got our foot in the door, we tried to open the door for everybody that was in our circle. So uh, it was a lot of collaborative work, Ryan. It was mm -hmm. a lot of helping each other with deadline jobs. It was a lot of one month, if you didn't have work or hadn't been paid for a job you turned in, one of the other guys had landed work, you know, we would work out the rent <laughs> uh, mm. pro rata based on what each of us could put into the pool that month. And, and uh, as our freelance careers sort of, it was an illusion, but as our freelance careers sort of stabilized, let me use that word, <laughs> uh, you know, that became less and less of an issue for us. And during that time, I continued selling work to heavy metal. My big first gig was a collaborative gig with Rick Beach. We landed doing the graphic novel adaptation of the Steven Spielberg film, 1941. It was we also were, I had managed to get my foot in the door at Marvel, uh, not with their four color superhero comics. Superheroes didn't interest me then and they don't interest me now. They never did. But I got my foot in the door with an editor named Rick Marshall. And Rick Marshall is still with us. I'm friends with him on Facebook. Uh, Rick Marshall was editing uh, their black and white comic magazines at the time. Uh, and there was one color magazine. He, oh, Rick Marshall edited the Hulk color newsstand magazine. And I started doing work for Rick, uh, Rick Marshall. So, you know, piecemeal between the time I graduated Kubert School and began work on Swamp Thing, uh, I was piecing together what we laughably called the living from you know <laughs> this kind of freelancing for whoever would have me. And sometimes that meant doing you know some crazy illustration gig. Uh, we did illustrations for a number of very strange book projects. Uh, the one I remember was a book by uh, that Jeff Rovin was the author and packager of, and it was this fictional uh, atlas for an imaginary planet. And you know Rick Veach, Tom Yates, John Tolman and I did all these illustrations of the monsters and the creatures and the you know the the geology of this planet. Sometimes it would be comic work, and that was what we really were after, you know, comic stories. During this time, because of heavy metal, um, Marvel launched Epic Illustrated, and that became mm -hmm. the main conduit for Rick Veach. Rick Veach has work in every issue of Epic Illustrated. If he doesn't have a story in there that he wrote, drew, and colored, he colored, for instance, he did the color on uh, the John uh, Busima um, Silver Surfer story in the first issue of Epic Illustrated. So some of us found purchase like that kind of thing. Uh, Tom Yates was the first of us to break the logjam at DC. Uh, we found out that there was a, a prejudice at DC against the Cubert School students. Nobody was going to give us work. We all kept going up there for interviews. Huh. And we couldn't, we couldn't figure it out. We're getting work from Marvel. You know, I, I have this very healthy, happy, well-paying work relationship with Scholastic magazines. Um, and they paid the best rates of anybody in the New York comics market at that time um, and had the best printing. Um, and we couldn't get our foot in the door at DC. And it turned out there was some kind of internal company firewall that had been put up. They would interview us, you know, they would pay lip service, but nobody was gonna give us work. And it was Tom Yates um, and editor Len Wein who were the two that broke that jam. Len Wein, I don't know what Len did internally, but he was the first one to, to go, enough's enough, you know, these guys are good. And Len began uh, feeding freelance work to Tom Yates. And after that, the door, you know, gradually opened to DC for others of us. Now I mentioned Tom because Tom got the first regular periodical gig of any of us, okay? Mm -hmm. I would argue that Rick Veach had a periodical gig with his freelance work for Epic Illustrated, because as I told you, Rick was in every single issue. But right. Tom Yates, when he landed Saga of the Swamp Thing, that was the first full periodical comic any one of us had landed. And Tom was responsible for penciling and inking every issue. The writer was Marty Pasco, um, mm -hmm. and Marty, bless him, just passed away beginning of this year, uh, 2020. And uh, Marty was a close friend of Len Wein's. So there was a personal and a professional bond there between Len, uh, who was the editor of Saga of the Swamp Thing, and need I say, the co-creator of Swamp Thing, right? It was Len Wein right. and Wrightson who created Swamp Thing. Uh, and Tom jumped on it and went for it. Now, Tom had it in his head. Tom loves adventure comics. Just like I'm addicted to horror comics, 
Tom's first love still to this day is adventure comics. And there were no adventure comics, <laughs> right? Um, right? I would argue that Tom had an even st steeper uphill battle than I had because nobody was doing horror comics when I left the Kubert school, right? There were no <laughs> horror comics out there. So Tom, you know, is the closest thing he can find to an adventure comic. He was thinking, oh, Swamp Thing, the bayous in Louisiana. Well, that's kind of like drawing the jungles. You know, that's almost Tarzan <laughs> of the Apes. But as soon as he started work on Saga of the Swamp Thing, Marty Pasco, who's a very urban gentleman, immediately has Swamp Thing pulled out of the swamps. And Tom began to get very frustrated because it was issue after issue after issue of Swamp Thing being put in a crate in the back of a truck or he's on a train car you know running like a hobo to another corner of the country it's it's everything tom wasn't interested in drawing <laughs> um and around issue i want to say around issue 12 or 13 of saga of the swamp thing tom let john Taliban and i know he was going to leave the book he was going to do about two or three more issues and then he was going to go and that we should audition for it that tom would bring our samples up to Len Wein. And, and that's what got us in the door at Saga of the Swamp Thing, is we did some tryout pages and we did some full page character shots of some of the Len Wein, Bernie Wrightson characters from the first 10 issues of Swamp Thing. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we did some of them with John Toddleben penciling and me inking. And we did some of them with my penciling and John inking. And Len looked at the work and went, right, you guys got it. Steve, you're the penciler. John, you're the inker. And that was the combo he wanted. And part of it was I had the stronger storytelling chops at that time. Um, and I'm talking 1983. I mean, John's storytelling chops were right up there <laughs> during our mm -hmm. run on Swamp Thing. And by the time John was done with Swamp Thing and moved on to Miracle Man with Alan Moore, John, you know, was, was right up there with the best of them. Uh, but John had a much stronger ink line than I had, more supple, uh, more seductive. And John, from the time he came to Kubert school, he could draw circles around all of us because he had been very classically trained in high school. Okay. Like he got the kind of art program that, you know, my college years didn't give me. Um, so John had tremendous uh, uh, chops as, a, as an illustrative artist. So between the two, Ryan, look for odd issues of um, Scholastic Weird Worlds. Okay. Look for the reprint uh, books that we later did. One was called Fear Book where we collected some of those scholastic stories that uh, I had a hand in. Uh, look for issues of heavy metal. Uh, look for the 1941 graphic novel, uh, which was Rick's and my big break uh, for mm. a movie that tanked at the box office. So the book was on the <laughs> main <manger> tables <laughs> very yeah. quickly. And also look for some of the odds and ends that I did in the uh, Marvel black and white magazines, particularly okay. uh, Bizarre Adventures. Okay. And that's where I did my last big freelance gig before Swamp Thing. John Toddleman pitched in and helped me finish a story that um, my late friend Steve Perry had scripted, and it was called The Blood Bequest. It was a Dracula story. And we told the origin of Dracula. And we created a new character called Varney the Vampire, uh, which Marvel has since used. Varney appeared in Doctor Strange comics and a few others as this prehistoric vampire who was the first vampire. And that was my last big gig before starting work on Swamp Thing in 83. Like I said, Swamp Thing, I mean, there's only, to me, there's there's two Swamp Thing artists. There's Bernie Rison and, there, and there's you for like my favorite Swamp Thing artists. Like, I don't think anybody can come close. Your splash pages are insane. Of the absolute editions, <laughs> get even better because it's larger than the regular issues, you know? I just wanted to, like, I, I, we'll talk about the Absolute Editions because I, I want to ask you about those, but I'll ask you this first. Um, what was what was the working relationship between um, all of you? Like, you, you were working with Alan, you were working with John. I think uh, Rick Veach later was also working with Rick. You. Rick was in on it from the start. In fact, okay. Rick and John began assisting Tom Yates before I did. Uh, okay. Rick and John, Rick and John were assisting Tom Yates starting with Saga of the Swamp Thing number two. So they were oh, okay. right in. Okay. They were right in there from the beginning. Uh, so anyway. Uh, all right. Well, I need, I need to go back and get those because I, like I said, I'm only familiar with the ones that uh, I, like I got Saga of Swamp Thing, the, the first trade that when Alan Moore started his run. Right. Um, that's what I got when I was younger. Um, but I just wanted to ask what that working relationship was like, because it seems so it's just such a perfect combination of all of you 
in that book that it just, I mean, it's, it's magical. I mean, I'm telling you, like, the storytelling from, from your art to Alan's scripts, I mean, the, the, the issue with, um, hit with Swamp Thing and Abby where she eats the fruit and stuff like that, the issue is insane, you know? So I just wonder <laughs> what, that, what that working relationship was like back then because it was like, it's just, it's, I don't find many comic books like that. I mean, I go back and read a lot of old comic books because I find that I, I kind of enjoy them a little bit more, especially like if I get the actual issues. Um, I like reading on newsprint. I don't, I, I don't really like the, the glossy as much. For, for my reading experience, at least. Right, Yeah, right. Uh, You know, I just want to, uh, what was the experience like back then? Well, I, for for all of us who are on the, on the United States side of things, mm -hmm. it was initially an extension of how we had been working together for years already since Kubert School. You know? Right. If somebody needed help, you pitched in. If you were working on a page and you got stuck, you know, you, we reached out to one of our buddies. I mean, Rick Veach was helping me from issue 21 on. Um, uh, I pretty much did the pencils on number, uh, the Marty Pasco issues, number 16, 17, the portion of 18 that we did and all of 19, that's all me on the pencils. But starting with issue 21, I was in part because of the deadline crunch. We were always behind schedule on that book. Um, mm -hmm. in, so in part because of the deadline crunch, I was re reaching out to Rick. But also when I got that script <laughs> to Swamp Thing 21, um, I have long hair now. I didn't so much back then. The hair went up on the back of my neck because it was the greatest comic script I had ever read in my entire life, Ryan. And mm -hmm. in fact, that script for the anatomy lesson was everything Rick Beach and I had been talking about since we met in 1976 that we thought was possible in comics, but we didn't have the writing chops to pull off. And there it was, right? And I mm -hmm. wanted Rick to, he had to come read the script. I needed his help. I wanted him to be part of what, you know, what was happening. And I really needed the help because we had just had our baby girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was a father for the first time and uh, my wife was working full time. So, uh, you know, do the math. It, it was yeah, tough. Yeah, I know um, I'm a dad, I, I get it. You get it, right. So <laughs> I mean, all, all the grief I get about, you know, how bad I was with deadlines during the Swamp Thing years. 1983, my first year is when my daughter Maya was born. 1985 is when our son Danny was born. And mm -hmm. I was the one home alone with the kids up all oh, day, every day <laughs> uh, except for weekends and you know my wife working a full-time job she didn't want to carry that weight of the you know the household chores and stuff when she got home she had just gotten off an eight-hour shift mm -hmm. so anyway how was it so the way it was is we already had a chemistry big time john Tolliban, rick beach myself we had the same chemistry with our buddy tom yates who was stepping away from the book but tom was still doing the covers DC at that time liked the continuity of if an artist was leaving the book, they would try to retain that artist doing the covers. So the illusion of the transition was mm. less visible to the casual reader. It would still look like the same comic, you know, with the same artwork from the issue before uh, when, a, right. when a, a reader saw it on newsstand. So we had a chemistry. What was mind blowing is that as soon as Alan Moore was part of the mix, he, he functioned on the same level. It was just as primal a bond. The uh, chemistry was just as fertile, if anything, more fertile all of a sudden because we're working with Alan. We were already fans of his work. Uh, I've mentioned this in, in other interviews that Len Wein was sort of disappointed when he called John Tolliban and I separately to tell us we'd be working with a new writer. And he said, oh, it's a writer you've never heard of. And I said, oh, who is it? And he said, Alan Moore. And I was, Alan Moore, I love his work. And we had been, <laughs> we had been buying and reading Warrior magazine, which was mm. the British uh, comic magazine that had been coming out in England for about a year, year and a half at that time. So mm. John and I had already, and Rick, you know, we'd all been devouring uh, the Marvel Man mm. that uh, Alan Moore and Alan Davis had been doing together. And... Um, also, and and uh, Gary Leach was another artist on Marvel Man, even more than that V for Vendetta, you know, the David Lloyd, Alan Moore collaboration. I thought V for Vendetta was the great English language comic of the 1980s, and I still believe that. So we knew Alan's work. And the weird thing was, this is before the internet, Ryan, okay? Mm -hmm. So think about this. Every, no, nobody had computers in the home. There was no digital production of the comics. 
we were doing everything in our home studios. Um, we would occasionally be able to, you know, Rick Beach would drive over and give me a day or take a page or two home. And then we'd get together later in the week and swap out. Or well, John Toliban was in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, and I would say probably three times, maybe four during the Swamp Thing years, um, John would come out and spend a few days, you know, no longer than a week with um, my family and I, and we would, you know, labor away on Swamp Thing. And it never stopped, but we found we had the same chemistry with Alan Moore. And as soon as Len Wein told us Alan was the writer, we asked for his mailing address because we couldn't call him on the phone. It was too expensive to be calling from America yeah. to England at that time. So we immediately wrote long letters to Alan. John and I both sent out letters. And lo and behold, the same week we mailed our letters, a long letter came in from Alan Moore. He'd already written to us before even receiving our letters, right? He had asked Len the same question. What's the address of Steve Bissett and John Toliman? And um, it kind of frustrated Len Wein that we were <laughs> communicating and he wasn't privy to it because the way comics worked in those days is it was like we were working in a car assembly plant, right? Mm. I was the guy that was bolting the frame together. John Taliban was supposed to put the doors on, you know, Tatiana mm -hmm. Wood was going to spray paint the car when it was all assembled to, to extend the metaphor. Um, and here we were already making plans about where we wanted to go with the book. And our, our editor, our traffic cop, the person in charge of coordinating all this was out of the loop. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, and we had a little bit of that with Karen Berger, although Karen was, Karen welcomed that Karen, valued that right we were removing part of the labor associated with editing comics because we already had a chemistry as a team and it was really cooking it was really working and if anything i was the most difficult member of the team for a number of reasons not just the deadline but also i would get alan's scripts and alan turned in complete written scripts it wasn't i had worked marvel method where you get a plot that right. might fill a page maybe two pages and then you've got to translate that plot to whatever the page count the editor has given you. Mm -hmm. um, with DC, and we were already used to working with the DC method, and we had worked with the DC method. I had already scripted stories that I sold Joe Kubert that other classmates had scripted. Uh, I mean, that other classmates drew from my script. Uh, Alan was doing full script. So I had the whole 22-page issue in front of me. And I did not turn in pages in order. <laughs> right? Alan would set up his scripts so that there were visual cues that would appear at the beginning of a story and they would pop up again at the end of the story. So I would work on those pages first because I wanted to make sure the visual cues synchronized with one another. My editors were always pressuring me for more pages in every package. So I would pencil the easier pages first and save the harder pages for later, right? So that they mm -hmm. got a package that had five or six pencil pages in it instead of just two or three. There were plenty of rationales I can give you, Ryan, as to why I didn't draw the pages <laughs> in order. But it was something that drove Len Wein up the wall. And it was something Karen Berger did not enjoy, but accepted as uh, this is how Steve works. A big part of it for me as well is Alan Moore and I were both coming from certain writers and filmmakers as our inspiration. And among mm -hmm. them uh, were, um, you know, uh, uh, writers like, Oh, God, why am I drawing? Oh, Thomas Pynchon was one of Alan Moore's favorite writers, right? Mm -hmm. um, we both had a great affection for a filmmaker named Nicholas Roeg, whose big films prior to our doing Swamp Thing uh, would have been Performance with Mick Jagger, Walkabout, uh, The Man Who Fell to Earth with David Bowie, and my favorite, Don't Look Now with Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie. And Nicholas Roeg had a way of telling the stories in a nonlinear fashion. He would, he would, he would tell the story almost like a set of mosaic tiles. Mm -hmm. And he'd start from the outside of the story and work his way in. So the linear climax of the narrative might not be the end of the movie. The end of the movie would be the emotional climax, which might in the linear narrative actually be an event that happened in the middle of things. Alan was a master of that kind of puzzle storytelling. Right. So that with the reader is helping put the pieces together and think about some of those Swamp Thing issues that we did together. You know, the one where where Abby has just had an emotional breakdown and she's lying on the floor nude 
you know, and you don't know what the hell just happened to her. And you might have looked back to the issue before and went, did I miss something? <laughs> and the rest of the story is Alan teasing out what it is that happened to Abby. And that was our love and death issue, the one that lost the code. I love that. That to me was vital, contemporary, cutting edge storytelling. And we were getting to do it in a four color mainstream comic book for DC Comics. Um, but that's also why I was working on the pages out of order because I wanted to, um, I wanted to also sometimes save the best for last. Like those two double page spreads in yes. that issue of Swamp Thing, I think I did those I think I did the one with Abby at the beginning of the gig, but I saved the double page, you know, just say uncle spread as the mm -hmm. last thing I was going to draw. Cause that was going to be the most fun, you know, that was yeah. us going full balls right out horror. And, yeah. and I was saving it for last. And so anyway, um, so the chemistry was really strong to answer your question. And mm -hmm. for those of us on the drawing side of thinking, it was a chemistry we already had. Once Alan was on board, it blew us away that he was right in sync with us and actually leading us down paths we hadn't even imagined possible. And we never, you know, no slight to Marty Pasco, we never had that chemistry with Marty, uh, in part mm -hmm. because we didn't know Marty, in right. part because we got Marty's scripts. Uh, um, the first one we got was complete, and every script after that we got piecemeal. In fact, I penciled all of Swamp Thing 19 the last Pasco issue I penciled with mm -hmm. Marty calling me on the phone and dictating pages to me like two at a time. And it, you know, that's just not conducive to doing your best work. And then you talk about Karen Berger. I, you know, she's one of the first editors that uh, along with Shelly Bond that I really kind of paid attention to. So I was wondering, you know, when did Karen kind of step in from, from Len Wein? Because I, I, I mean, I know Swamp Thing wasn't, originally vertigo but it is i mean essentially it is considered a vertigo book right because that yeah, was swamp thing what vertigo. led to vertigo i mean right you know, what we did on swamp thing led to vertigo and, and right. i don't i i don't know but i i think in a parallel universe had we not worked with karen or had we not been doing swamp thing or had karen not taken over editing swamp thing i don't there might not have been a vertigo i you know i think i think it was what was happening in swamp thing that kind of became the gestation point for what became Vertigo. And I can say, and this is a fact, Karen Berger called me at one point uh, when I was no longer doing Swamp Thing full-time and I was working on Taboo um, mm -hmm. shortly after the first issue of Taboo came out. So that would have been what, 88? Yeah, somewhere around mm -hmm. 88, Taboo 1. Uh, Karen called me asking for uh, contact information on some of the artists in Taboo. Um, and she said, you know, we're thinking about doing something like what you're doing with Taboo, but on a much bigger scale. And I look back and it's like, oh, that was Vertigo, <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, so it's possible even Taboo played some sort of catalytic role or, mm. you know, my John and I starting Taboo was definitely an extension of our Swamp Thing years. But to your question about Karen Berger. Yeah, I was just wondering what... what um... What was her, because I, I, I hear like, I mean, every editor has a different like style, right? What was uh, her style as compared to Len Wein? Because I think like, I, I still like, Vertigo is one of my favorite imprints in the history of comic books. I, I mean, it's created so many of my favorite stories. But when I picked up Swamp Thing, it was branded Vertigo. So like, I always assumed like, oh, it started then because I was uh, very young. And then as I did my research, I'm like, oh no, they just, they changed it because I mean, it should have been Vertigo. Vertigo started you know, nine years earlier, right? right. Um, but I was just wondering what her edit editorial style was kind of like and, and what that, uh, if that kind of, but as opposed to Len Wein, like, like did she kind of bring something different out of you guys than, yeah. than Len Wein? She did. Uh, Len was great. And I really value the, the, of course. the fact that we got to work with Len. But it was a short, you know, we worked with Len. I mean, John and Rick, uh, through their working closely with Tom Yates, um, had a longer uh, working relationship with Len Wein, technically, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Although I don't think they had much interface with Len. Tom obviously was, Tom Yates was obviously the one that really had the week to week, day to day. But, um, you know, our tenure with Len Wein started with Swamp Thing number 16, the first issue that John Tottleman and I collaborated on. And Len's last issue was number 24. Okay. okay, so that's how short our window of working with Len was. 
Len was funny. Uh, I there's a couple of stories here that I'll I'll boil down because I've told them elsewhere. Uh, the tersest, angriest phone call I ever got from Len Wein. Uh, I picked up, and this is before call waiting. I have to keep reminding you that you know a lot of technology we take for granted now didn't exist then. The phone would ring, and you'd pick it up. And you know we didn't have digital phones. There was one phone on the wall in our in our uh, living room <laughs> area. That was the one phone in the house. The phone rang. I went to pick it up, and very uncharacteristic of Len, who was a very jovial fellow, not even a hello. He goes you are playing a very dangerous game, young man. <laughs> Whoa, you know, I knew I was a little late with the pages, you know, and I'm immediately through my head, I'm going, oh God, I'm going to get fired. He had spotted a Gumby that I had slipped into the pencils on one of the pages. <laughs> John Taliban and I had this game where we, were, we would hide the little clay animation character Gumby by Art yeah. Corky in Swamp Thing. And Len caught it for the second time and he wasn't, having any more of it and he insisted we stop and that was the strongest phone call i ever got from len weed that's what pissed him off right <laughs> uh everything else you know even when deadlines were tight and things were going nuts you know len was very uh conversational len Wein would turn me on to movies because mm -hmm. he was in new york you know he got to see movies before they came to vermont and uh, I remember one day Len calling me and I was, I had just FedExed out some pages. So I was like, Len, I just put the FedEx out. And he goes, no, no, I'm not calling you about that. I just saw this movie, Hell Night. You got to see it, Steve. You'll love it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and that was a lot of fun. Karen was very different. Karen was one of the three or four best editors I ever got to work with, ever, mm -hmm. okay? Um, the big difference between Karen and Len is Len... Don't forget that Len entered the comic book field as a pro uh, right. in the 60s. And he, he found his perch in the comic book industry as a writer and then later as a writer editor. But he was also a cartoonist. He was, a, he was an artist as well. And Len often would get frustrated, particularly with cover designs, because he saw us as his pair of hands. The clearest example I can give you, Ryan, is uh, Len called me once. He wanted me to do a Batman cover. And I, I think it was for Detective Comics, but I, I don't know which Batman title it was for at the time. And he was calling me. I was second string. He had already been through something with another DC artist about the covers. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm the next guy in line he's calling. And he says, Steve, I need this Batman cover. I need it really quickly. And he had this picture in his head, and he described it to me. And Ryan, I turned in like 10 roughs and not just like loose pencil drawings, but tight marker paintings, essentially, working right. with the four or five elements that Len had described to me over the phone. None of them were right. Um, <laughs> those roughs were so tight that Amazing Heroes later used one of my roughs as a cover for Amazing Heroes. Kim Thompson had seen the roughs in my folio at some convention and he remembered one of them and he was the editor of amazing heroes which was a fanographics um uh, comic uh, fancy and he asked if he could use the cover and i said sure and we we worked out something i got paid a little bit and fanographics sent me a box of free books that's how tight those roughs were i mean i didn't doctor the drawing at all for the amazing heroes cover it looked like a painting um oh, nice. len was not happy with any of them and i went len i've done 10 variations I cannot think of another way to do this. And he got exasperated and said, thanks for trying. And there was no kill fee. I didn't get paid for my time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Then he called John Toddleman. And John ended up doing the cover that was printed. But John told me that even when he was done, Len still wasn't happy. Like Len had, he had some picture in his head, Ryan, that we just were not, we weren't hit. Karen yeah. didn't have that. Karen didn't see any of us as her pair of hands. Karen didn't want to be a writer. Karen didn't want to be an artist. This meant that her approach to the material as it came into the office was she was the pure, unfiltered, perfect reader, okay? And she just responded to what was in front of her. She was very attentive. She was very careful. She was very nuanced. She was paying razor sharp attention to everything that was coming uh, in. Um, she uh, made difficult calls sometimes. Like one of those difficult calls was Alan Moore turned in 
what he thought was the script for Swamp Thing 29, which was going to be part one of the Nuke Face papers. Mm -hmm. And Karen rang up Alan and went, this is a really good script. We will use it down the road. But we're building a readership right now. Sales are going up every issue. And this is too slow paced. I want a real knock and bed horror story. <laughs> and in two days, Alan knocked out Love and Death, which became the issue that lost us the comics code. Obviously, he delivered big time. Yeah, wow. Karen, that's in two right. days. That's crazy. And, and um, so Karen was, and, and she also took me off a couple of issues. You know, there was one, I was supposed to, John Tolliman and I had co-plotted with Alan Moore the whole water vampire story. Mm -hmm. um, I have very fond memories of Alan's one visit to Vermont. And we were walking in the woods with my little daughter, Maya. And we were, you know, three grown men <laughs> walking around, working out the biology of, of you know, uh, water vampires, how this was going to work. But when it came time to do the issue, I was late turning in the first two or three pages of pencils and Karen pulled the plug. She said, Steve, you're too far behind. You start work on the next issue, which Alan will have the script to us by next week. And I'm giving this issue to Stan Walk. And it was a punishment. Like Karen knew that I had co-plotted that issue. And, oh, man. you know, there was a punitive aspect to it, but she was also no nonsense. Like the book came first, the schedule came first. And this was more than just a slap on the wrist. This was like, you know, uh, get with the program, Steve. And, you know, this is after our son had been born. They, both kids were home births. I mean, I was just overwhelmed every single day. But, you know, Karen, Karen would make those hard calls. And I bring it up in the context of telling Alan Moore that a script he had just worked hard on and delivered on time was going to have to wait. Um, we indeed later did the Nuke Face Papers, which was a two-parter. But Karen's call was spot on. You know, that issue of Swamp Thing ended up being the one that put us off the charts. Upped our sales, we lost the code. It got us a buzz in the horror community that we didn't have as yet. Um, mm -hmm. People were suddenly paying attention to what we were doing. And part of it was, you know, the unintended consequences, which was a, a fucking nightmare for Karen for a week or two, was losing the code on her book with no time to redo it, right? Yeah. There was no time to fix the problem. <laughs> yeah. So, and it ended up becoming the catalyst for Vertigo. You know, losing the code was the best thing that could have happened to any of us, including Karen. But I bring it up as an example of she could make those hard calls when it was necessary. And she rolled with the punches. There were times where, well, I'll go back to that issue 29. When we found out we lost the code and that it was creating all these problems for Karen, John, Alan, and I, by this time we were speaking regularly on the phone, we all got together and as a group, you know, we presented to Karen, if this is going to be a problem, take us off Swamp Thing, put us on another book where we don't have to deal with the code, and we'll just keep them working together as a team. You won't lose us, but, you know, if, if this is what it's going to mean, then let's work on something else. And, you know, the, the powers that be at DC and Karen went, no, we want you to stay on Swamp Thing. You know, they had a good thing yeah. going. But that, that gives you some inkling of how much pressure she was under up at the office at that time. You know, right. um, yeah. and she didn't get angry at us. You know, she there was no vindictiveness from Karen because we as freelancers had dared to bond together in solidarity and say, we'll step away from the book. Um, mm -hmm. Karen said, you know, let me think about this. And uh, but also said, don't, you know, guys, don't. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and there was no anger from her, you know, like Karen understood if we push back, there was the reason we push back and including with that swamp thing 29 when we lost the code initially it was because of the zombies and the flies around their head oh yes and i pushed back i i was mail i was fedexing out uh pages that morning i was working on the annual down amongst the dead men and i threw into the package uh clippings from our local newspaper uh, we were in southern vermont but i bought the uh, the uh, western massachusetts newspapers because the movie theaters that we could go to were listed there and there were two zombie movies that opened that weekend. And I clipped out the ads because they had zombies with flies around them. And I said, Karen, if this is okay with a family newspaper, you know, what's the codes problem? Um, yeah. And that's when, co when whatever conversation Karen had with the code, the code came back. But then they actually read the comic and they went, oh, incest, right? Abby's husband is possessed by her dead uncle. That's incest. Um, yeah. And that's when it was final. There was no way to fix this. You know?
I'm so glad the code's gone. Thank God it's gone. Oh, yeah, yeah. RIP, the Comics Code Authority, <laughs> yes. died in 2011. That was the year the code closed up shop. And yeah. they closed up shop so quickly, Ryan. Academics and historians are beating themselves up over this. They emptied the office and threw all their records into the dumpsters. So that whole any paper history that might have existed of what went on behind the scenes at the Comics Code disappeared in the trash Man. in 2011 when they closed up shop. So Dang, that's crazy. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to ask about the Absolute Editions. Okay. I, I want to know how, how closely have you been working um, with them to create these? Because I, I, I know Steve Olaf recolored everything so far. Um, I know there's a lot of back matter. I know there's a lot of material that has had to have come from you too. I two part question. I wonder how involved you've been, and is there ever a possibility that we could get an artist's edition of any of that stuff? Like, are, do you have any of the art, or is any of the art, even if it's like piecemeal, is there a chance that we could possibly see that? Um, these are great questions, Ryan, and <laughs> forgive my being cagey <laughs> as we go in. I'll start with your last questions first. I don't know what John still has. I don't. You know, and and I don't know what Rick still has. I've held on to a few pages. Bear in mind, in the 1980s, while we were working on Swamp Thing, we were the lowest page rate DC Comics was paying at the time. Okay, so part of how John and myself subsidized continuing work on Swamp Thing is we got invited to go to comic conventions, or uh, retailers invited us at their expense to do an appearance, a signing at their shops. And I'm not just talking locally. You know, New England for me, Buffalo, New York, Pennsylvania for John. We were flown to Texas, to California, to North Carolina, to, to Kentucky. Um, and we would bring our original art and sell it. And, and John understood the art market. And the original art market at that time in the 80s, you know, getting 80 bucks, 75 bucks, 80 bucks, 100 bucks for a page was really good. And we were getting that. And that money that we earned from doing sketches at 25 bucks a pop, 30 bucks a pop, and selling artwork is what allowed John and I to go home with cash in our pockets that kept food on the table, that kept mm. the bills being paid. I've said this before in interviews too. I mean, my, my wife, my first wife, uh, Marlene, was working full time at a school for autistic children. And I was working as hard and as fast as I could on just doing Swamp Thing for DC Comics. There's very little work I did elsewhere during that stretch of time. Mm -hmm. And we were below the poverty level of income in Vermont. We, got, we were on the WIC program. We got free dairy for our kids. That's how mm -hmm. poor we were, okay? Um, same with John Tottleben and his wife, Michelle, in Erie, Pennsylvania. I mean, we were scraping by. I was getting 63 bucks a page for pencils. And John was getting, I believe, in the vicinity of $45 a page for his inks. <clears throat> and at that time, there were no royalties. Swamp Thing wasn't selling that well. We never earned royalties on the comic when it came out. We mm -hmm. do continue to earn royalties, and we get royalties every quarter from DC. They're the only publisher I've worked for that honors those contracts and those commitments. We still get quarterly royalties, but we earn way more now not working for DC than we ever earned working for DC. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> so I, uh, the, that's my long answer is a lot of the artwork is out there. A lot of the original art is in the hands of private collectors. And of course, those pages have gone up in value. I mean, I've only sold, I've only sold maybe three or four pieces of art since the 1990s. And the last one I sold, I got 20 grand for, okay? Wow. <laughs> and I got to pay income tax on that. But And I'm not saying it to brag. I'm just pointing out no, the yeah. disparity between you know, what we were able to get in the 80s uh, for our original art and what it goes for now. Believe me, John, Rick, and I wish we had hung on to all our original art because, uh, you know. So, uh, yeah, uh, if there's an absolute edition, I'm sh I, I know from the experience that Scott Nabiakin had, he was the editor on Absolute Volumes 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. um, he reached out to many private collectors. They scanned some of those pages for Steve Olaf to color from original art. Oh, okay. And, I was going to um, ask that too. Right. So, so Scott, um, who is no longer at DC, he was let go in the August purge. He's no longer yes. up there. Okay. Um, and in the, for the context of your, of your viewers and listeners, uh, AT&T bought Warner Brothers mm -hmm. and throughout 
this year, 2020, it's not just the pandemic we've been dealing with in terms of DC Comics. They've had, yeah. I know of at least three, you know, uh, staff purges that have gone on. Um, yeah, recently it was like, I think a month ago, right? Or a couple weeks Yeah, ago. November, just last month. Yeah. You and I are talking, you know, early December. So it just, yeah. they just did another one. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen. You know, AT&T calls the shots right now. They're, mm -hmm. uh, I can already see uh, that they're changing the rules at DC. Uh, they're certainly changing the tune in terms of how freelancers like ourselves are dealt with. Um, but it's in their hands. Any chance of an absolute edition rests with DC Comics and their corporate parent, mm -hmm. uh, which at this time is at and I don't know how lucrative those volumes are. Uh, I can tell you if they happen, there's probably not anything in it for us. We'd be lucky to get a comp copy. Um, but I'd love to see an absolute edition for sure. I mean, for me, it would be fun just to have that good a repro from our originals of pages that yeah. John, Rick, and I haven't laid eyes on for decades. So yeah, I'd love to pour um, over that. I mean, the absolute the artist edition um, of the original art I would love to see, but the absolutes have been phenomenal. Like getting to see your art larger than a single comic has been it's been, it's been really dope to be able to see. And I mean, they better finish it off. They better. I mean, I think there's only one more. There's, there's only one more to go. They're, they've all, we have been contacted in November about an absolute volume three. I can't say much else because right now we don't, there's no one left up there. Right. Scott lebiakin has gone. Uh, a lot of the bonus material that you saw in the first two volumes mm -hmm. were favors that John Taliban and I provided to Scott. Um, oh, okay. My relationship, my relationship with Scott goes back to the paperback uh, six volume Saga of the Swamp Thing collections. Mm -hmm. And Scott was very fair in dealing with me. Um, and in fact, was very respectful when, when he approached me about reusing the text essays that I'd originally written for Titan Books. Uh, Titan Books in England did these black and white paperback editions of the complete Alan Moore Swamp Thing. And collectors really covet those today because they're the only black and white printings other than those essential vertigo comic book format reprints. I had written text pieces for Rick Beach's run on the series after I had left, but when Alan was still writing the series. And Scott was very respectful. He reached out to me. He understood I owned the copyright on those text pieces. So we negotiated a contract where I retained that ownership and I was giving, you know, I was paid for permission for them to reprint it. I mm -hmm. don't know if any of that's gonna happen now, Ryan. And, oh, and I'm man. speaking to you at a time where it's all up in the air. Yeah. In terms of the bonus material, I mean, already it was getting difficult with Absolute Volume 2. Uh, to be candid with you, um, there was an additional text piece that was written and delivered and uh, DC Legal would not bend on you know <sighs> what I asked, which wasn't extravagant. I, I wanted to retain copyright on the piece and I even offered it to Scott for free. I didn't even want money as long as they could respect that I owned, you know, that short essay that it was my property and I was letting them use it. And DC Legal would not countenance that. Uh, they crafted a very ingenious contract that said in one sentence, I own the copyright. And in the very same paragraph spelled out everything they could do with it, which meant I didn't own the copyright. And this is where we're at with corporate law right now in North America. This is what freelancers are up against right now. That's I don't so understand why anybody would work for DC and Marvel as a freelancer right now, unless you really, really, really have that ache and boner to be drawing Batman or work on Spider-Man. Uh, I see no rational reason to work with um, the companies now because they're paying flat rates, no royalty. And uh, I can tell you from hard experience, um, that John Tuttleman and I and our, our partners, our spouses, our households have benefited enormously from the fact we earn royalties from the work we did back in the 80s. And if that's all gone, why? I, I, my advice to the next generation would be, don't do it. Um, yeah. And I hate to say that because the work we did with Swamp Thing, I'm really proud of. And, mm -hmm. um, and we were really fortunate that we came together those of us who worked on that book and got to work at that time with DC. But it was also a very unique time in comics history. You know, the 80s, everything was blowing up and changing. And right. we were fortunate enough to work with DC at a time when they were going through certain changes internally. 
and uh, Paul Levitz, who was pretty much in charge of DC through the 80s and 90s, um, was trying to redress uh, the company's ill treatment of the older surviving cartoonists from the Golden Age and the Silver Age. Mm -hmm. And we benefited from that. I mean, our, our uh, royalties benefit a great deal from the fact that we get a share of John Constantine. We earn, oh, more wow, okay. off, we earn more off John Constantine appearing in a video game than we earn off of our reprints of Swamp Thing. Right? Wow, insane. And that's because we happened to create a character during a time of relative enlightenment at um, you know, uh, at DC Comics, and I, right now I can tell you that that's not how it's that's not how it is right now up there. Yeah, and I'm very sad to say. Very sad and it's say. it's very upsetting as a fan. I mean, like I I grew up, I would say leaning more towards the DC characters. You know, as a kid, and I've as a, just and now I work in retail in the in, in comic book stores and i'm seeing what they're doing and how it's affecting retailers and, and oh it's a nightmare right now i mean it's, it's just it's a nightmare insane. um we can talk about that another time if you so choose i i have nothing to lose no so i mean honestly no no I, I mean i i mean i'll, I'll skip over i had a, i was a couple of times, i'd much rather talk about this so um, i was gonna say you know like you've seen a lot of change we saw you know the 80s or you know um, we saw the black and white boom. There's stuff like that. That was a huge shift, right? And that, and then from the turtles being created by Eastman layered, right? And that off something. Then we see the '90s. We see Image and and what they've done. And we've seen a lot of changes. Right now is uh, I think another dramatic shift that we're seeing in the industry. I mean, it's not just the fact about digital comics. Um, oh no, of, that's more that's, in a play. That's part of it, but, but but I also have to stress, Ryan. Part of what's going on now. I I just finished. I just retired from teaching. I taught comics for 15 years at the mm -hmm. Center for Cartoon Studies. Um, and my role often, and my students would, thought I was joking, you know, we'd start a semester and I'd say uh, something along the lines of, you know, I'm the old guy in the bar in the Dracula movies <laughs> telling you not to go up to Castle Dracula. But I know you're going to go to Castle Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, uh, I, the positive thing that's happened is the mainstream of comics is no longer with DC and Marvel. The mainstream right. of North American comics is with Scholastic. It's with mm -hmm. Abrams Books. It's with, you know, the New York Review of Comics has its own imprint, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we are at the, we are at one of the points we didn't even dare of dreaming existing in the 1970s when I entered the field. Um, and there is unlimited potential out there for cartoonists. Um, and it's part of why I really caution cartoonists to pursue their own paths, their own work, rather than do work for hire for the companies where you're, you know, if you've got to get a Batman story out of your system <laughs> and yeah. you're lucky enough to get your foot in the door, okay, do your Batman story, but then get back to work on your own property, the thing you own that you are saying. And the change has already happened, Ryan, because, um, when I went to Kubert School, there was only one memoir comic that existed, and mm -hmm. that was Harvey P. Carr's American Splendor. And for my students at the Center for Cartoon Studies, every year, memoir had become more and more and more the key genre of graphic novels and comics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, landmarks like Fun Home and Persepolis and so on. Um, yeah. I mean, let's go back to where the conversation started. I cannot tell you how jazzed I am that the creator of Persepolis, her newest, she's directing movies now. And my wife and I just got to watch Radioactive on Netflix, her brand new movie, a mm -hmm. biopic about uh, Madame Curie and the discover, discovery of radiation and radium. Oh my God. I mean, so the creator of Persepolis is getting to live the dream that I harbored as a kid in Duxbury, Vermont, back in the 1960s, something that was impossible for me um, is now part of the landscape. Um, but it does mean for comic retailers like yourself, you know, unless 50% or more of your store is graphic novels coming from Scholastic and Abrams and these other companies, if you're dependent on DC and Marvel, oh my God, you know, yeah. I, 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 I won't say anything more than that because I don't even want to say I fear for you because that's a very dangerous thing to say in the midst of a pandemic. But yeah, yeah they're not making it any easier. There is no one in DC who could answer our question when we said, are we getting comp copies of Absolute Volume 2? 
it's we're, you and I are talking on what December fourth. Yeah. The only copies I have to give my family members. You had to buy. I had to buy many at full price. I know. That's I saw crazy. that post. I saw That's that crazy. post. I, I was what, I was offended when I saw that you had to buy your own copies. You know. And then to get a query from you know the we didn't even hear from the editor of the Absolute Line. We got a query from an assistant editor asking if we could you know, give something to the third volume. And our year started with the Swamp Thing TV series. And the only way we got to see the Swamp Thing TV series, which we got nothing for, um, which is fine, right? I mean, if Len and Bernie were still alive and with us, they created the character. They're the two creators who should benefit from a Swamp Thing TV series. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the only way we could even see a TV series that was acknowledging and lifting from the work we had done was to get bootleg DVDRs from friends. That's how we started 2020. And to end 2020 with dropping 600, 700 bucks, trying to afford Christmas gifts for my loved ones of my own fucking work. I mean, I don't mean to bitch, but you know, that's not a yeah. great frame to the year 2020. It's nothing no. compared to, you know, if we had lost a family member or heaven forbid, I or my wife had suffered from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But in terms of freelancer relations, for the yeah. company to reach out to us in December asking for a favor, you kind of, you kind of, you're professional, you bite your lip, you're courteous, but it's, it's not fun. It's not fun. You know, yeah. in our 60s, we're all in our 60s. Uh, Rick's in his uh, early 70s. We should be resting on our laurels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the world. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That's, it's, I, I love comic books. I, I mean, comic books are my passion. I don't create them, but I love talking about them. I love immersing myself. I love talking to all of you guys that I get a chance to talk to, you know? Look at all yes. the long white boxes under yes. my flat yes. files of original yes. I fucking love comic books. Yeah. I'm totally with you. These, that's all graphic novels over there. Right. Oh my On the God, other side yes. of these file cabinets, those are all graphic novels, many of which I used in my teaching. You know, one of my classes was the history of comics uh, that I taught for 15 years. I I love this medium without mm. reservation. I still love movies. I still love cinema, but I love this medium. And it's that love that drives us. It's the love that keeps you going as a retailer. It keeps me going as a creator. I draw every day now. Um, but the business of comics is a bitch. There's no way around it. You know, <laughs> and we get, we yeah. hit these little, you know, we hit these little sweet spots where for a year, maybe two years, something's possible that didn't seem even, you know, imaginable before. And then, you know, as we're seeing right now for a multitude of reasons, you know, the window shut, the door shut and, uh, uh, we're we're going to see a major regression. I mean, the, the comic companies are already going back to the same business practices that drove away um, generations of, of very creative people who found other ways to make a living um, yeah. outside of comics because there was no way to do it in comics. It is ridiculous to me, Ryan, that I can get more for a sketch that I do for a fan that I still own the copyright to, right? Mm -hmm. I can put out a sketchbook of you know, a, a published sketchbook of those sketches I'm doing, then the companies offer me to draw a work for hire cover. And it's That's insane true. to me that the rates have dropped since the 1980s. They haven't gone up. Yeah. Um, and there's also curious wrinkles. You know, I, 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 I'm friends with Don Simpson. Don Simpson is about to have an, uh, uh, a book edition come out of one of um, the comic stories he worked on that has gone on to become quite historic. And that is the story in Pictopia that was written by Alan Moore. Mm -hmm. But because Alan Moore won't allow his name to be put on the work, it's coming out as Don Simpson's in Pictopia. And that's very frustrating for Don. It's gonna be very frustrating for you as a retailer, if you even order it to carry mm -hmm. in your shop because people buy Alan Moore's work. <laughs> and yeah. if, and, and so here's Don Simpson in the unenviable position of having done creator-owned work, right? That he shares ownership of the copyright on. And he's mm -hmm. not permitted to put the name of the writer on it. Um, and it drives him nuts that the absolute edition Swamp Things come out 
and you look at those glorious spines and it's a swamp <laughs> thing by Alan Moore. Yeah. And there's Don going, oh, the work for hire stuff has his name on it. And I can't put it. And I, I put it out there not to beat up on uh, anybody connected with that, but just mm -hmm. that's one of the perverse curves none of us could have foreseen in the 80s and 90s um, yeah. when we were working on this stuff. Like, you know, uh, it's funny. It's just funny how this stuff plays out. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting time uh, in comics for sure. I, I do want to ask, you know, you said you're drawing again. So I recently was able to get those issues. I, I learned about Tyrant from your interview with Cartoon Escape Babe. And oh, cool. I found out you were selling them. So I, I bought the I bought them. It was insane. It was beautiful. I love it. Are is there going to be more of that? Number one, that's one part of my question. Two, what else are you working on? And when you mentioned that sketchbook possibility, I, I think that needs to be that needs to come out and maybe you do a Kickstarter. I don't know that. I, I think that that would be really awesome. I know it's thousands upon thousands of people that would, would back that project. So well, we'll see if they do. Uh, my friend, my good friend Mark Mastel, who's a terrific cartoonist. In fact, Mark has a graphic novel collection out of his Swords of Sharpay, which um, our mutual friend Tom Snagowski, best-selling mm -hmm. novelist, Tom Snagowski, and Mark Mastel uh, did a number of years ago. Um, Mark Mastel has designed not one, but two monster sketchbooks that'll be out in 2021. Much to Mark's frustration, I held off on putting them out last year or this year. Um, part of it is I, I just retired. Uh, part of it is and I won't get into this, you know, there are certain rules when you hit 65 and you begin drawing uh, Medicare uh, mm -hmm. as to what you can and can't earn. So I had to wait for the year 2021, but we have two sketchbooks that'll okay. be out this coming year. One is called Thoughtful Creatures and the second one is called Brooding Creatures. And those will be the first two sketchbooks. Um, we're doing them with uh, Ingram Spark. So hmm. it will be available to comic retailers. Okay. I know it's frustrating to comic retailers when we do print on demand with Amazon, uh, but I am doing more print on demand books with Amazon. I experimented with the form uh, for a number of years and back in uh, November of 2017, I put out a book called Cryptid Cinema. It's about, you know, Bigfoot movies, Loch Ness mm -hmm. Monster movies and so on. Uh, and I'm gonna be doing more of that in 2021. Um, okay. Some of the books I'm, I've am i got in the works are the kind of thing you would love to have in your store. Um, some of the books, you know, I do a lot of books related to film that I know doesn't interest retailers. I mean, these were my two releases this year from mm -hmm. a British publisher. This okay. is a, uh, and these are, this is work I did as a writer. This is a, a 660 page book about one movie, David Cronenberg's mm -hmm. The Brood. Okay. Uh, and this is a new work of fiction. I am one of uh, five writers who collaborated on a book called Studio of Screams. Uh, these both came out from PS Publications in the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, so I also do a lot of work as a writer that, that people just, you know, I get it. People that are into comics want to see more comics. So to answer your question, this winter, if I sell enough sketches and I'm able to, you um, uh, get enough financial footing. I have cleared board time and I'm working on uh, two new Tyrant stories. And I'm not yes. going to be continuing. My original plan for Tyrant was to do a single long work. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm writing and drawing self-contained short pieces mm -hmm. uh, with Tyrant. And these earliest stories that I've got uh, focus on young Tyrant when he's still in the nest. And I'm going to try to find a perch for them. Uh, David Lloyd, the co-creator of V for Vendetta, has been very patiently waiting for three or four years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the first comic format Tyrant story will appear in uh, the uh, digital comic anthology that David Lloyd puts out. Okay. Um, but I'm also doing this, the same story in storybook form for kids and a little less scatological, you know, whereas in the comic story, and I know kids, I've got grandkids. I know kids love poop and, you know, piss and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. but, but grandparents who buy kids' books don't necessarily <laughs> gravitate to books that have shit or piss or whatever. So yeah. um, the kids' book versions will be uh, um, done in storybook format. Um, the comic versions will be, you know, pure, pure shot of a set. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of weird shit goes on in, in the comics. Yes. 
Um, and I'm also working on uh, some more volumes of Cryptid Cinema. This is the book that's still available uh, uh, on Amazon. Okay. And my son, Daniel, and I um, uh, have been completing some interviews with some of the filmmakers uh, that were connected with uh, The Legend of Boggy Creek, the 1972 mm. Bigfoot movie that really put, you know, that started the whole Bigfoot movie cycle. Um, and that'll be the first of the new Cryptid Cinema volumes. Uh, but there will be more comics. And I've been doing, I, I mean, I've been drawing almost every day this year. And part of it is I retired back in May. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time in 15 years, Ryan, that I didn't have to prepare a syllabus and get ready for a new semester. <laughs> yeah. um, I miss it terribly. And I really miss, like, there's a whole new group of students I haven't even met. Mm -hmm. And I miss that. But uh, you know, whatever time I have left in this world, I'm going to spend as much of it in the studio as I can. The hard part is, I wish I could tell you, Ryan, yeah, I'm going to self-publish tons of new comics, but, um, you know, there, there's no publisher out there that's approached me about anything. Uh, the one comics project that I won't talk about yet, because we haven't um, brought it to the point where we want to talk about it, there is a large collaborative project with um, two creators I'm very excited to be working with. And uh, hopefully that'll be part of my 2021. We're, okay. I, I, I'm in fact, next this coming week, scanning artwork out of my sketchbooks and uh, pieces I've done to send to uh, the two writers on the project because they're putting the pitch uh, package together. Um, okay. And we'll see where it goes. It's very exciting. I don't know what my role will be on it. I mean, I, I got to collaborate with them on the story last summer. And then mm -hmm. we all agreed to kind of table it because they teach as well. And I was teaching my last year. Right. Um, if, if you don't teach, you do not understand how completely, you know, the semester can derail your life because everything you're doing relates to your job and your students. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, I, I'm excited about that. I don't know if I'll be penciling it. I don't know if I'll be uh, designing characters. I don't know how much or how little I'll be directly involved, but I'm looking forward to it, whatever the involvement is. And uh, I did get to collaborate a little bit on the writing process. They sent me what they had, and I came back to them with story ideas. Um, they wanted to work with me because of my horror background. And mm. uh, it's really gratifying when you get an email from someone who's going to be a collaborator where they're like, whoa, that's freaky. <laughs> like, oh, okay, <laughs> score. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't mean to be, uh, you know, this is, this is called vague booking, I'm told by my friends. So I'm being a little vague with it. <laughs> But if the project comes together, I think that'll be something that people will be interested in and excited awesome. about. And it's unlike anything else I've ever had a hand in. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to anything. Anything new by you, I'm definitely down to check out and I'm excited for. Um, but before uh, we get, before I let you go, I do want to ask one more question, kind of industry related. I was wondering, like, we're kind of go going back to what we talked about, like, you've seen so many ups and downs of the industry. What is, in your mind, or in your opinion, what, what do you think we need, or the comic book industry as a whole, we need to see for it to continue to um, kind of grow and survive past this, uh, this well, the shit storm that we're, that it's kind it's, of right now. You know what I mean? It's a real shit storm. You know, part of, part of, I'll tell you, I have a lot of hope. And I have a lot of hope because I think we're at a curious time, for the first time since the 1950s, where comics are accepted mm -hmm. you know we we are we are free of the stigma of the frederick wortham uh and the senate subcommittee investigations of the 1950s you and i b both celebrated the death of the comics code yes. earlier in this conversation okay that's yeah. done that is done um and we're in an era where i mean i i've got i, I i've got one friend who was a student at ccs is one of our many alumnus um, Chuck Forsman put out a mini comic, you know, this isn't the mini comic, but you know, a little self-published, uh, public comic publication, mm -hmm. um, called, and I don't know your language barriers, bleep me if you must, the end of the fucking world. And Chuck <laughs> Forsman self-published it as a mini comic. And that mini comic made its way to a comic shop in England and was adapted by channel four into a TV series that's on Netflix right now. And I'm sure it wasn't all sweetheart and roses, but Chuck got treated much better 
than any of us that were ever involved with Swamp Thing, ever, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I look at that and go, okay, there's hope. Like that's positive change. And if a cartoonist can put that work out there, that pure and that undiluted and retain their ownership so that they can build their career on the building blocks of other media, be it television or movies or video games or whatever, wanting to license their work. That is how the future of comics will grow. That is how better comics will come about. That is how graphic novels will continue to be vital. Um, there's a lot of hurdles and we're facing major ones right now with the pandemic, you know, you as retailers. I, I, because I worked in the video industry as a retailer, I mean, I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a grocer's son. I worked in grocery stores from the age of six until I was 21. I get it, I get mm -hmm. it. And I worked in a video rental and retail store from like 1998 to 2005, right when distribution in the video market was trying to do the same thing the distributors had just done in the comic market to deep six, the whole direct sale market. Right. Um, I get it. I have seen it from the inside. I have seen it from the outside. I have seen it as a creator. I've seen it as a publisher and packager. I've seen it as a retailer when I was in the video market. I totally get it. Those who um, are sharp and clever and roll, not just with the punches that these companies throw you, but figure out ways to keep their shop going by diversifying their product line. Um, mm -hmm. They're gonna survive. And we're facing major obstacles right now. Uh, I cited Scholastic as one of the premier publishers of mainstream comics right now. Mm -hmm. What's their primary method of selling their work? School book fairs. Right. What's one of the most dangerous landscapes in the pandemic? <laughs> Schools. Right. Scholastic is already having, to, you bet they are having meetings and scrambling, trying to figure out like, how do we address this, right? Mm -hmm. um, they may go back to their old SBS book club model, where, which is how I bought Scholastic books as a kid, where you got a little flyer every month. I remember with, that. With a coupon and you yes. check out the books you wanted, you know? Yeah. And it may go back to that for a time. Um, who knows? Who knows? People are going to invent ways of doing things that you and I, Ryan, could never dream of right now. And mm -hmm. it will get them and it will get comics through what's happening right now. But the key is we're in a generation where I believe more kids and more young people, and when I say young people, I mean anybody 40 and younger, are drawing, writing and drawing their own comics. I think we have a larger base of American citizens that create comics than that buy comics. Mm. And I think the key is going to be how do we get to reaching that consumer <laughs> so that buying comics becomes the same kind of habit that it was when I was a kid growing up, when comics were everywhere. We've never right. seen America glom onto comics the way that some countries in Europe do, the way that Japan does, you know, the right, right. history and so on. So sky's the limit in one way and a lot of the cultural prejudices that my generation had baggage with your generation does not have baggage with and mm. that is a, a that is a source of hope and inspiration for me i don't know it you know kickstarter and crowdfunding is how a lot of people are getting their work out there right now mm. um, it's going to be a nightmare for historians and academics 10 20 30 years from now because there's going to be no way to read the books that are getting yeah. crowdfunded right now because they're only printing print runs that fit the people that kick in. So we're that's in true. this gold, we're in this creative golden age that's going to be, I fear, invisible. Mm -hmm. You know, in twenty years' time, uh, not because of the pandemic, just because right, of this right. crowdfunding model, which has been so lucrative and liberating um, in print-on-demand books. We don't know how that's going to go. You know, what happens when I die with my print-on-demand books? Does Amazon just keep all the money? Right? Do, do they say oh, we own the rights yeah. now and my kids have to suck wind? I don't know. I'm already seeing friends like Mark Bode struggling with a print on demand book that's out there. And the person who put it together, whose bank account is where the money went, passed away this year. And Amazon doesn't even want to communicate with the owner of the trademark and the property, Mark Bode. So we're entering really weird legal waters, you know, um, yeah. including the AT and T merger. How DC's decisions are impacting you as a retailer? Where suddenly, 
it's not just a bottleneck to get the books. You're not allowed to buy the books. It's crazy, you know? Yeah, that's um, yeah, pretty crazy. So anyway, yeah. hopefully that um, was an up note to end with. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I like you like you said, I, I try to stay uh, be optimistic and stay positive because, I mean, I don't ever think that comic books will go away. But I also don't want to see um, I also don't want to see retailers negatively affected because I think anybody that opens a comic book store, they're not opening it to become millionaires, right? Like yeah. they're yeah. because they love comic books and it's something they're passionate about. It's much like like I don't make money from doing my YouTube channel. I don't make money from my podcast. I do it because I love it. I love talking about comics. I love talking to creators, you know. And that's um, so I, you know, like I said, I just I, I try to stay optimistic and positive about things and. You know, I love getting insight from, you know, people in the industry that are seeing stuff that I don't see, you know? Yeah, yeah. And we're really, I mean, God, the books that are coming out right now. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. The new comics that are coming out. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I have, there's creators I follow. And I'll go to their Etsy shop every six months and buy whatever new work they've got out there. Like, that's one place I buy my comics. Um I buy from, you know, uh, the online book dealers and we're seeing a golden age in reprints of comics that were impossible to get our hands on, mm -hmm. you know, for what it would cost me to buy one copy of an EC pre-code comic, I can get six bound volumes right. <laughs> yeah. of that work printed beautifully. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a downside to that, right? But there's also this glorious upside to it as well. Um, right. Uh, you know, I hear from people, including some of my loved ones, who don't dig the absolute swamp things, right? They look mm -hmm. at them and they go, uh, this coloring is horrible. You know, I, I love the old comic books. And it's like, uh, that's, their, that's their passion and that's their point of view. And that's great. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, this is getting our work to a whole new generation. Mm -hmm. And these are part of why I tolerated whatever I tolerated with DC to offer bonus materials to volumes one and two is because my hope is these will be the volumes that future fans, scholars, academics, researchers will turn to when they're researching our work. And I want to make sure I've put something in there that makes people understand what it was like when we did this work. How did we do it? You know, mm -hmm. and, and hopefully the two volumes that have come out, the bonus materials helped address that. I believe they did. They're so, amazing. Yes. Um, I, yeah, I love it. And I can't wait for the third one. And um, I want to thank you again so much. My great pleasure. I hope we didn't go yeah. on too long, but it was a lot of fun talking with no. you, Ryan. It's yeah, dude. No, I mean, I, I, I could go longer. I just, I got to. We'll do it again. Thank you for doing this. My great pleasure. It's been great to Please. meet you here. And um, if you could just real quick share where everybody can find you online. And I will also drop those links down below. Sure. Uh, I'm on Facebook primarily these days. I know that's where the old codgers go, but it's the only social <laughs> it's the only social media platform that has really helped subsidize the work I'm doing. I sell mm -hmm. I sell books there. I sell sketches there, um, and I do the sales occasionally. I do not have an online store. I know that's frustrating for people right now, but um, but that's how it is. Um, mm -hmm. I am on Twitter, uh, but I do not find Twitter uh, particularly conducive to either conversation <laughs> or, or doing much. Yeah. Of anything. Um, yeah. So right now, Facebook is where you'll find me. There are uh, two fan pages. There's a pro page uh, called Stephen R. Bissett, uh, writer, packager, uh, artist. And there's a fan page that um, uh, Bob here put together called Stephen Bissett, writer, artist. And you also mm -hmm. can find me on Facebook under my own name. Um, I'll also send you, Ryan, and you can add to the links. Um, I have kept up. Um, the archival blog, I kept a blog for like 10 years and mm -hmm. I used to post every day and toward okay. the end every week. Uh, I have not let that blog die. So if people want to go back and uh, dig deep, I did multi serialized um, essays about what it was like working on specific issues of Swamp Thing with examples of the artwork, the scripts, everything. So okay. I'll send you those links as well, Ryan. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, like I said, I'll drop those down below. And again, thank you. And I can't wait to do this again sometime, man. Okay, let's do it uh, in the coming year. I'll have new work to share with you by then. And we can talk about something new and happening. So uh, yes, for sure, man. Have a good one. Okay, take care. Thanks.